going to begin this morning by telling you how God taught me personally the difference between happiness and joy. Back in the day at the university, Thanksgiving was one of the highlights of the year. We would have hundreds of guests on the campus and the dining common would produce a marvelous dinner and they always set the tables with real china and they'd have doilies under the glasses and special napkins and candlelight and every year they would design a new placemat and of course they were paper well my two daughters would um, it, woe be to anybody who spilled on Thanksgiving Day because they gathered all that up and took it home to play with and it would be around the house for for days after well that placemat is long gone but my daughter Donna recreated one and I have it there on your handout but one day we went in and the verse said although the fig tree shall not blossom neither shall the fruit be on the vines the labor of the olive shall fail the fields shall not yield meat the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation. Well, you know that God gives each one of us gifts and talents and abilities depending on what he wants us to do. But every one of those talents or abilities that he gives us has a built-in danger. If you misuse it or if you depend on it wrongly. Well, God gave me a good mind. Now, something I did, he just gave me a good mind. It's very logical, very retentive. And the danger that comes with a good mind is found in Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Lean not to your own understanding. Well, that's my biggest thing I fight against. So, we walked in there all happy on Thanksgiving and saw that verse, and I didn't like the verse. I wanted, blessed be God who daily loadeth us with benefits, or he who gave his own son, how will he not freely give us all things? I wanted happy. I wanted happiness, and I was not satisfied with joy. And all day long, the verse nagged at my spirit. I knew who chose the voice. I couldn't say, wonder who chose that. I knew who chose the, the verses. but. It went on for days, and of course the placemats were there in the house. So I decided I better study Habakkuk. Because I, did, I had to know why he wrote that and, and at the end. So Habakkuk is a short uh, book, only three chapters. And we don't know much about Habakkuk because he's never mentioned in the Bible other than in his own book. And we can tell from the context that he was a priest and that he lived probably just before the captivity. Well, Habakkuk has conversations with God, and that's good. God likes us to have conversations, and I think God wants us to be honest with him. And as you go through this, you'll see that Habakkuk and I had the same problem. See, Because Habakkuk says, how long must I cry to you for help and you do not answer? And then he talked about the nation of Israel, that there was violence, injustice, wrongdoing. The law was not effective. There was strife. There was conflict. And God was just letting it happen. So God answered him. And he said, in effect, I do have a plan. But he said, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, and they're going to march through the breadth of the land and take the houses they don't own and they're going to take you captive and they're going to plunder Israel and they're fierce and they're violent and they're cruel. Well, Habakkuk didn't like the answer. And in our vernacular, what he said to God was, God, you're better than that. Or what they say now, that's not who we are. That's what he said. He said, you're too holy to do that. I have the verse there. He says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you can't look at iniquity, 
And how can you let such a wicked, wicked people come and destroy us even though we're a little bit wicked? But they're really, really wicked. And so it would be wrong for you to let them defeat us. So Habakkuk does like I do so many times. You know, you come to God to pray, but you give him a plan. You say, here's the plan and here's my timetable. Please do this. But God has a way of getting his attention. And so all of chapter 2 is God's answer. I picked out three verses. The first one is, is verse 4 where he says, The righteous one, the just, shall live by faith. This famous verse, one of the most famous in the scripture, this is the only time it's in the Old Testament. Um, the writer of Hebrews uses it at the end of chapter 10, just introducing chapter 11, the famous uh, hall of fame of the people who lived by their faith. They trusted what God said, and they lived their lives by what God said. So he used it there, and then, of course, Romans, Paul uses it in his defense that salvation is by grace through faith alone, without works. The just shall live by faith. That's the first lesson God taught Habakkuk. We live by faith, not by sight. People with my mindset, it's our tendency to want to live by sight. We have to, to live by faith on purpose. The second verse is verse 14. He said, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the water covers the sea. God was telling Habakkuk that he didn't need to look out for his reputation, that he would take care of his own reputation, and God, that Habakkuk need not worry about God doing something wrong. And then the marvelous verse 20, he says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before them. This reminds me of the verse in, in Psalm 46 where he says, Be still and know that I am God. What does that I am God mean? That means he is in absolute control. You see, he is God. We, we don't question him. You remember Peter in, in um, Acts 10, isn't it, when they tell him to eat the meat? And what does he say? Not so, Lord. Can you say, not so, Lord? No, if he's Lord, you say, yes, Lord. If you say, not so, he's not Lord. You see, well, that's what God is saying here. I am God, you be still. Let the earth keep silence, I am God. Habakkuk learned the lesson. And just before the verse that I read earlier, he says, when I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. And then he made that description of everything bad, and then he said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hind's feet and make me walk upon high places. See, he had learned that joy is God. Joy is God is in control. God is going to work things for my good. And even if the circumstances are bad, I can have joy because of God. I have a, one of my, my favorite study Bible is um, Reformation Heritage Bible and it because the reason I love it is that at the end of every chapter, it gives you one or two or three paragraphs of application of that chapter. Things to work with with your family or, you know, as you read through the scripture. And the third paragraph on chapter three says, Real contentment is found only in the Lord. When we are living by faith, we do not allow circumstances to control our emotions or dictate our feelings. It is normal to be happy or sad as circumstances dictate. But if we find our ultimate contentment and satisfaction in the eternal God who never changes, external stimuli are not the controlling factor. Habakkuk describes a situation in which nothing was good. But he was rejoicing because his joy was in the Lord. At the end of the chapter, at the end, it's like at the end of some of the Psalms, it says that Habakkuk gave it to the musicians to set to music. 
when I first read that the first time, I thought, who would want to sing that? But I asked our daughter, Laura, to drive up from Atlanta, and at the end, she's going to sing that passage for you. Hap is the basic, basic English word for happenstance. And if you read books from 200 years ago, they would use the word. It's used in the uh, King James Version once, and that is where it says that Ruth came by Hap to the field of Boaz. Did she come there by Hap, by chance, by just some odd thing? She walked along there and thought, I think I'll stop at this field. No, we know that God had that planned. God made it so that she went into Boaz's field, and we all know the end of the story. Things do not happen to us by hap, by chance. But a lot of people depend on their happiness, their, their circumstances. So if the children are behaving, their health is good, got plenty of money for what you need, no um, problems with parents. Some of you are in that time where you've got parents you're caring for and helping with grandchildren and children. And, and you know, sometimes circumstances are good and sometimes they're not good. But we need to learn to find joy. I wrote down for you several um, different definitions of joy that I found. It's kind of hard to define joy. It's easier to define happiness than it is joy. But some of these I really um, liked. Um, the second one there, joy is a state of mind, an orientation of a heart, a settled state of contentment, confidence, and hope. I liked that. The Baker Dictionary of the Bible gave me some problem because it said that it's the triumph of faith over adverse and trying circumstances, which instead of hindering joy, actually enhance it. And I thought, Trying circumstances are supposed to enhance our joy? And, and I, I, I studied over that quite a long time, and I wondered about leaving it out. <laughs> Why would trying circumstances enhance our joy? I th God saw fit when I got my note from Jeanette to tell me which lessons she wanted me to teach to have our family in the midst of two very difficult circumstances. I won't go into what they were, but uh, one of them still unsolved, very, very difficult thing. And to be studying this lesson and applying it at the same time has been a marvelous experience. I hope I can convey some of what God has taught me. But to know that even when the circumstances are like in Habakkuk, and we can still find joy and have confidence in God to know that he is in control, to trust that he can bring good from circumstances that seem to us to be so bad. Those things have been real joy. And I've been able to pretty much sleep at night. And if I don't, I review my lesson. Um, but it is true that when you can go through a very difficult thing, be it health or financial or legal or anything kind of trouble and you can rest in God it does bring you joy you know the verse that says we sorrow not as people who have no hope and that is we think of that only in terms of death but it's true in every circumstance of life we do not sorrow as people who have no hope I really liked um, in written by a, a book that I bought uh, about the gifts of the Spirit, it says, Biblical joy can only arise with a relationship with God. And then a warning, the quality of the relationship will determine our ability to withstand the horrible tests and trials ahead. He assumes that they're going to be horrible tests and trials ahead. And he says our relationship with God uh, determines that, how we're going to come through that. I liked Elizabeth George's in our book, The Best, of all the definitions I found. Down toward the end of it, she said, joy is not based on our efforts, our accomplishments, or our willpower. We can't say, I'm going to be joyful. 
We cannot make a resolution on New Year's Eve. This year I shall be joyful. It's not based on our willpower, but it's based on the truth of our relationship with the Father through the Son. Joy is not merely an emotion. It is the result of choosing to look beyond what appears to be true in our life to what is true about our life in Christ. I loved her definition. Now, the next thing we'll talk about is the enemies of joy in our life. The first enemy, and perhaps one of the biggest, is sin in our lives. We all know when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? Hid. They didn't want to be in God's presence. We know the story of David's great sin, and when you read the 51st Psalm or the 32nd Psalm, how he prayed for God to restore what? His joy. He restored the joy of my salvation. And in the 32nd Psalm, he says that when he was silent, when he was not repentant, his bones waxed, waxed old through the roaring all the day long. What a miserable picture that is of David not dealing with his sin. Satan's lie in the media, Satan pre presents sinful things as marvelous and pleasureful and everything w wonderful and joyful about doing all those things. It's a lie that we see around us constantly and we have to be on guard to know that that is Satan's lie. I think some of us uh, have trouble though when we read like that list right above the fruits of the spirit where it lists all the, th the works of the flesh we're supposed to, you know, we might look at that and say, you know, well, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. And, you know, it was a book written about respectable sins. Sometimes we, we concentrate on adultery and murder and we leave out envying and strife and causing division and, and those things. It's interesting to read the what those words all mean. Hatred could be translated contention. Variance means causing strife. Emulation, that means jealousy. Wrath, which means anger or ill-tempered. Um, strife means selfishness or selfish ambition. Sedition is causing divisions. Then heresies and envyings. Those are sins which we can be committing and, and not be so much aware of. I made a special note about discontent, envy, and jealousy. It says, whenever jealousy and envy are distinguishable, jealousy can be defined as the fear of losing what one has, while envy is displeasure aroused by seeing someone else have something. And envy is called the rottenness in the bone in the scripture, and, and the word actually means to look at ill will with a person because of what he is or what he has. We cannot compare ourselves to other people. We must um, know that God loves us and provides what he wants us to have. Another danger for joy is misplaced confidence. Our source of joy must be our relationship with Christ. We are not to put confidence in our flesh, not in a good mind not in successful ministry or saying I'm a spiritually mature person or my personal habits or how well I know the Bible or comparing ourselves to other people. All those things will be destructive to our joy. Uh, it was interesting when Jesus sent out the 72 disciples and they came back and they were saying how wonderful the ministry had been and he said, even, they said even the demons were subject to us and Jesus said don't take joy in that. Take joy that your name is written in heaven. Joy, he told them not to get their joy from the ministry, but from their relationship with him. Difficult things, chastening and discipline. Hebrew says, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. But afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Romans says that we tend to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And it's hard for us to imagine that in ourselves there is still sin, and we have to realize that. Psalm 19 is one of my very favorite psalms. We have uh, several of the verses in a calligraphy on a central wall in our home, so if you walk in our house, that's what you see. You know where we are. 
Uh, but after that marvelous part in the middle where it talks about all the ministry of the Word of God in our hearts, the converting the soul, making wise the simple, you know, the passage. Then it comes to three verses, uh, verses 12 through 14. The first one says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Now this is not something you lock a door and go in and do something all alone that nobody knows about. This is talking about some attitude or action inside you that displeases God that you're not aware of. He says, who can understand his faults? Cleanse me from secret sins. God wants to use his word and sometimes chastening to bring to our attention things that is, is displeasing to him. Think something that he wants to change in us. Then it goes on to say, keep back my, thy servant from presumptuous sin. That would be sin that I'm very aware I'm doing and I choose to do it anyway. And so the scripture would keep us from doing the presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. And then the psalm finishes with this marvelous verse, let the words of my mouth, even the meditation of my heart, even my thoughts, every word, every thought, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Um, what a thought, that we would not have a thought that crossed our mind that displeased God. Um, sin is, um, Satan can disguise it in so many ways. Then it comes to trials of faith that can hurt our joy if we let it. Um, I just think that verses, James, count it joy when you fall into testing. Do you do that? Do you say, oh, good, Lord's testing? <laughs> no. No, we don't count it joy when we fall into testing, but that's what James says we ought to do. It's interesting to me that that passage there where James is talking about knowing that the trying of our faith works patience, and patience will have a perfect work. Uh, that the, the next verse says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and does not upbraid. That is talking about finding joy in a time of testing. We, we, we often take that verse separately, and it's okay. It's all right to say, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. But in the context, it's talking about when a trial comes and you are having trouble with joy because of the trial, you can say, God, help me understand this. Give me wisdom to understand why I'm having this trial, what you're trying to do in my life in this trial. Um, so we learn to trust God in the middle of a trial in a way that we'll never do it when things are happy and, and, and every circumstance is pleasant. You just do not learn to, to know and to trust and to love God in the same manner. It sometimes drives us to the scripture and we search and search in the scripture for answers and we, we gain in those times of trial. Um, just like our bodies don't stay healthy without physical exercise, our faith has to be exercised and God knows that. And he does it not for punishment. Just some of us look at physical exercise as punishment. But faith exercise is not punishment. And then it's possible to experience joy in the midst of trial, in the midst of weakness, even in pain. In fact, they can cause us to go deeper into his presence because there is where joy is, in God's presence. Thy presence is fullness of joy. And sometimes we can be strengthened by joy. We have a dear colleague that uh, has a chronic blood disorder taught at the university. And for many years, she, she's been on a chemotherapy-like thing for, I don't know how many years, 20 at least. And she has this, the, the joy of the Lord is your strength, a calligraphy over the door she goes out. And when she would come to teach on days that she didn't feel like doing it, she came with a smile and a confidence in God that has been so admirable to those of us around her. Third category is on cultivating joy. It's kind of a, an interesting thought that we are responsible 
to be joyous. But we're also dependent upon the Holy Spirit to produce that joy, as is true of all the fruits. We're told to do it, but they're a fruit of the Spirit. It's not by willpower. It's a fruit of the Spirit. But I thought, what can we give the Holy Spirit to produce the joy in us? We have to give him tools to work with. So I noted some things about producing joy. The first one is the Word of God. The Word is the Spirit's primary source to work with us. It's our responsibility to read it, to meditate on it, to memorize it, to listen when it's preached. Um, I take notes anytime the Word is being preached, not because I very often go back and look at them, but because it gives two ways for the things to get into my mind. Instead of just by hearing, I'm hearing, I'm writing, and, and it's just a lifetime habit of mine. But we need to pay attention to the scripture. You know, uh, scripture promises in, that if we read it and meditate and do what it says, we'll be prosperous and successful. That's mind-boggling, a promise like that in Joshua 1.8, that we read it, figure out what it means, do it, success. One time I was going through a period where I had given God a, a prayer request, but it was actually a, a plan and a timetable. And he did not like my plan and timetable. And I, I got very frustrated and it kind of consumed me. And I had a, a Bible reading plan that I was following many years. I read through the whole scripture every year. And I came to this verse in Colossians and God stopped me cold. It, it, it changed my life. It really did. It said, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. And I was not living that. I was not depending on God. I was, had my own agenda, and I wanted God to do it my way. And he told me to be patient, but it would take what? His power his glorious power. And then we come to trusting God. I think this is the whole crux of joy. Paul said he learned in what state he was to be content. Paul did not say this came naturally to me and it should to you. He said I have learned to be content. I have a quotation there from a woman book that I have on the fear of the spirit it's noted for you but it says Paul's joy often seems baffling to us because we fail to realize how closely our joy is linked to our personal desires and values if we want to experience Paul's joy we must take Jesus Christ and his gospel our greatest desire and our supreme value only then we'll be able to find joy in the midst of the kind of circumstances Paul faced as long as we value our personal comfort and pleasures most in life, our joy will always be enslaved to our personal circumstances. It's a very convicting thought and one that we need to think about when we come to periods when we're struggling with being content in our circumstances. Very verse that you all know in 1 Thessalonians 5, um, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Note that the preposition there is in and not for. God does not always expect us to give thanks for a circumstance, but he expects us to be able to give thanks in that cir circumstance. Thanks for what? That he's with us, that he is bearing it with us, that he's going to see us through that he gives us hope, that he has hope for our future, that he's doing good, that he's acting in tender mercy. All of those things we are to be thankful for. We don't have to say, now some people, I have heard people say that they are thankful that God gave them cancer because of what it did. I heard, read Fanny Crosby saying she was thankful that she was born blind and wouldn't trade it. And, and that takes a faith that I am not sure I have. 
but I can be thankful in circumstances because I know God is working in that circumstance to bring good. One of my dear friends has uh, one of, you, you're familiar with Spurgeon's Morning and Evening. You can get it now free online. I have it in a book because I like books better. But um, I often read them just short, one page for morning, one page for evening. But she has the November 11 um, devotion on her refrigerator. And I only put part of it in here, but you might want to read the whole thing if you have trouble with contentment. But it says, some plants die if they have too much sunshine. It may be you are planted where you get very little, but you are put there by the loving husbandman because only in that situation will you bring forth fruit to perfection. Remember this, had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. Be content with such things as you have, since the Lord has ordered all things for our good. Is that not a wonderful thought? If you could be, if there were any other circumstance better for you, that's where God would have put you. So, now we come to joy in the attributes of God. I'm not going to go over much of this. I'm just going to say you need to have passages in Scripture that are your anchor. And they need to be passages that show the attributes of God. Mine is Psalm 145. When I have trouble, when there's a... Uh, uh, a trial when there's something happened I go and I read the whole thing and I meditate and it says God is gracious and God is good and God is kind and he acts in tender mercy never acts doesn't do any anything apart from tender mercy and there's a whole whole chapter about and I've listed several of them there I don't know which one will speak to you personally but you need to have your scripture anchor and it needs to be this is our God. This is who God is. This is how God acts. And, and even though I have those, some of those memorized, I go and I read them. Sometimes I read them in two or three translations and, because I've got to bury myself in who God is, you see. Another thing is hymns. You need to have hymns of praise to God for who he is and hymns of comfort I listed some favorites of mine. Um, the, the services on Sunday were just like a feast to me. Um, the music extolling God and then what he does um, it was just uh, a, a marvelous thing. But you need to have those things so you can sing them around your house. Uh, I do it mostly when I'm by myself, but uh, they need to sing in your heart. And then we need to value joy. I found this um, convicting. Uh, Jerry Bridges in his very fine book on the fruits of the spirit wrote, joy should be your testimony. The purpose of joy is to make you feel good. Uh -uh. The purpose of joy is to glorify God by demonstrating to an unbelieving world that our loving and faithful Heavenly Father cares for us and provides all that we need. Did you ever think of that? That our joy is to be a testimony to other people. There were a lot of quotations about lack of joy. Why are Christians so miserable so often? It's easy to get tired and miserable and fall into self-pity, which is the great enemy of joy. We need to make ourselves remember the great truths of the gospel until we realize how inconsistent it is to say we believe such wonderful truths and then go around filled with misery, feeling sorry for ourselves, and spreading gloom all around us. Joy is not just an emotion, but flows from the exercise in our minds and wills of faith in God's promises in Christ. And then another one from Bridges, he says, we can go through life glum, bored, complaining, or we can rejoice in the Lord that our names are written in heaven and we have hope of an eternal inheritance. It is both our privilege and our duty to be joyful. 
To be joyless is to dishonor God, to deny his love and his control over our lives. It is practical atheism. Isn't that practical atheism? To be joyful is to experience the power of the Holy Spirit within us and to say to a watching world, our God reigns. I put on the back three hymns that are among my favorite in the world. Um, the first one is in the hymnal, but I put it in here anyway. <laughs> Carolina Berg uh, was a Swedish uh, poet and hymn writer, and she, she wrote Children of the Heavenly Father, which I have on the list. She wrote that when she was a teenager. Um, she was very sickly as a child, and especially in the Swedish winters, she often had to stay home all the time. And her father would, was a pastor, and he said her to putting, reading the scripture and then trying to put it into her own words when she was a child. And as a teenager, she, she wrote, What he takes or what he gives us shows the Father's love so precious. We may trust his purpose wholly to his children's welfare solely. Teenager. She was 22 when her father took her on a trip with him, and the... They were on a ferry on a lake, and a storm came, and he was swept overboard and drowned, and she watched. 22 years old. After that, she wrote day by day. And when you read those words and meditate on those words from a young woman who had been through trauma, which would kill most people, and she, she wrote those words, I... That, I had that memorized when I was a young teenager. It's been a great blessing to me. You were always good, which we heard sung so beautifully on Sunday morning. You know that Ron and Shelley found the music for this in Jonathan's thing after his untimely death. And they gave the melody to Chris Anderson and asked him to write words to fit it. So it's a, uh, knowing that and, and those words, but Though my eyes can't see, help my heart believe, you are always only good. If we can get that into our minds and our hearts, it's going to be... Uh, our, our four grandchildren all went to the wilds one year, and that was the theme song. And I was so thrilled. I told them, if you can have that truth in your heart, it, it will guard you your whole life, that truth. William Cooper lived uh, 1731 to 1800. His father was a clergyman, but it was one of those royal appointments, and from what I read, his father didn't believe much. But uh, Cooper was prone to depression, much like um, Jonathan probably, but um, by the time he was 33, he was in a private lunatic asylum. This would have been in the 1760s in London. Um, because he had tried to commit suicide three times in his depression. And a cousin came and led him to the Lord. And he was able to um, get well enough that they released him from the asylum. And God brought him together with John Newton, the great hymn writer of uh, Amazing Grace. And he was a pastor in a town. And so Cooper moved there, and he and John Newton collaborated on hymn writing and he set him to taking scripture and getting it into th words that people could sing distilling the truth of scripture into hymns and um, so Cooper worked there with John Newton and this song sometimes light surprises has had many melodies uh, through the um, 200 years or 300 I didn't figure up how many but uh, about oh, 25, 30 years ago, Craig Courtney wrote a new um, melody and did a beautiful choir arrangement of it. And Laura can't sing the choir arrangement, but she's going to come. Let's uh, close in prayer now, and then Laura will come and sing, and then we'll be dismissed after her song. So let's pray. Lord, we pray for a desire to have joy in our hearts. For some, it's so much easier than others. Our circumstances are all different, and we just pray that you would work in each one. We pray that you would help us to confide in you, to have our confidence in you, 
because if our confidence is in you, our great God, we cannot but rejoice. Sometimes a light surprises the Christian while she sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing in his wings. When comforts are declining, he grants the soul again. A season of clear shining cheer it after rain. In holy contemplation we sweetly then pursue the theme of God's salvation and find it ever new. Set free from present sorrow we cheerfully can say let the unknown tomorrow bring with it what it may. It can bring with it nothing, but he will bear us through. Who gives the lily's clothing will clothe his people too. Spreading heaven, no creature but is fed, and he who feeds the ravens will give his children bread. Though vine or fig tree neither their wanted fruit should bear, though all the fields should wither. Nor flocks, nor herds be there, yet God the same abiding, his praise shall tune my voice. For all in him confiding, I cannot but rejoice. I can. But bond rejoice.